I was 18 years old, and I was standing at the door. Well, I was standing at the door with my best friend Annie, and the guy at the door was six foot seven, huge, facial tattoos, bearded. And he looked down at us and he said, Well, I guess you girls better come in. And I looked at Annie and I, I didn't know what to do because we'd never been invited in before. And he started to walk down a long corridor. So I followed him and Annie followed me and I heard the door slam behind her. We present Deborah Francis White Rolls the Dice, episode two, Cult Following. Please welcome to the stage, Deborah Francis White. In each episode of this series, I'm telling a true story about a time in my life when I took a big life risk and rolled the dice. This week, I'm talking about getting out of a cult. You can play along by rolling the dice at home. If you don't have a cult to escape, perhaps you could walk out of the job you hate without leaving a note. <laughs> To follow this story, it helps to know that I'm Australian. I know I don't sound especially Australian, but I read a lot of Enid Blyton as a child, and I picked up the accent from the books. You should also know that I'm saying that in every episode of this series, whether I need to or not. When I was 14 years old, my mother announced... I've decided we should study the Bible with the Jehovah's Witnesses. They want to come once a week. To which my father responded... Tell them they can come once every two weeks. They came once a week after that. <laughs> now, I was baptised at 16 years of age, two years before I was old enough to vote or drink, which, as it turned out, was a moot point, because Jehovah's Witnesses are not allowed to vote or get drunk anyway. <laughs> Here are some other things Jehovah's Witnesses are not allowed to do. Smoking. Tobacco, marijuana or crack. Participating in the school play. Tanny Keenan stole my part in the pyjama game. Giving oral sex. Even if you're married. <laughs> Having anal sex. Even if you're gay. <laughs> Being gay. <laughs> Saying cheers before you drink. Even when it's Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> The year before we got baptised, we had a secret last Christmas as a family and we hid the Christmas tree in my brother's bedroom so that Jehovah's Witnesses wouldn't see when they came around. Saying bless you when someone sneezes. <laughs> and yoga. Now, I know what you're thinking. What have they got against yoga? Well, when you do yoga, your mind goes blank and the demons will get in. <laughs> Now, ironically, the reason you're not allowed to say bless you when someone sneezes is the pagans thought that was the demons getting out. And I always wondered if you could confuse the demons by going yoga, sneeze, yoga, sneeze, <laughs> like some kind of ecclesiastical spin cycle. As a Jehovah's Witness, if you break any of the rules on that list you just heard, and please keep in mind that that list is an excerpt from a much longer list, <laughs> you will get a visit from the elders. And the elders are just guys. They haven't been to theological college. They don't have any extra insight. It's not even their full-time job. They're just appointed by other guys. So essentially what happens is on a Sunday afternoon, two plumbers and an electrician <laughs> come to your house and say... That skirt you're wearing is too short. Fix it. On the upside, you can just dress a bit slutty if you need your wiring done. <laughs> but the worst time the elders ever visited me was when I was preparing to go to university, two days before my baptism. They came around and said... It's really better if you don't go. Why? Because they teach you about evolution at university. Yeah, I, I'm studying English and Japanese. I really don't think it's going to come up. Well, universities are a hotbed of fornication. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm dressed like Alice in Wonderland. Uh, I don't think I'm going to get a whole <laughs> lot of fornicating done, especially if I call it fornicating. <laughs> now, the first time you broke a rule, they just tell you off. But if it happened again, you could be disfellowshipped. And disfellowshipping goes like this. So you, sir, in the front row? Yes? Um, imagine you and I are both Jehovah's Witnesses. And imagine we're best friends. Actually, that probably couldn't happen because one of the plumbers would come around and tell us it was inadvisable for us to be best friends because we might end up having one of the sorts of sex on the list. <laughs> Do you have a favourite sort of sex on the list, sir? Doesn't matter, because we, we couldn't have it unless we were married and then only the missionary position. They like that one because it's named after them. <laughs> 
Uh, but you, madam, you and I could be friends uh, because you are, in fact, a woman, OK? Um, so that would be absolutely fine. Uh, could you tell me your full name? Leslie Claridge. Leslie Claridge. OK, do you know how to work out your Jehovah's Witness name? Put sister in front of it. <laughs> you would be Sister Leslie Claridge and you would be brother whatever you are. <laughs> so, OK, so Sister Leslie Claridge, say you got disfellowshipped. What's the last thing you did on that list you heard that you could be disfellowshipped for? Let's pretend it's yoga. Because <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's Radio 4. <laughs> First time, you'd get into trouble. But the second time, one of the plumbers heard you were in Downward Facing Dog. <laughs> there would be an announcement at the Kingdom Hall that... Sister Leslie Claridge has been disfellowshipped from the BBC Radio Light Entertainment Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. And after that, even if we were best friends, even if I'd been your bridesmaid, if I saw you in the street and you said hello to me, all I could say is nothing. Because if I even so much acknowledged you, nodded to you, admitted that you existed, I could be disfellowshipped too. So, Sister Leslie Claridge, if you wanted to be a Jehovah's Witness again, you could be reinstated. But you'd have to sit up the back of the Kingdom Hall for a year or two with no one making any eye contact with you or saying anything to you. And then if the elders made sure that you would never go into Downward Facing Dog again, they would announce that... Sister Leslie Claridge has been reinstated. And people would talk to you again. They'd be a bit suspicious at first. They wouldn't invite you home for tea. The Jehovah's Witnesses can drink tea, by the way. That's the Mormons that can't drink tea. I always enjoyed that because sometimes you'd be working the same street as the Mormons, like some kind of evangelical sharks and jets. <laughs> and I'd always be like, so, uh, you boys fancy going for a cup of tea after this? Oh, uh, we can't drink tea. Oh, no, that's right, you can't, can you? Well, we'll be over here having a delightfully caffeinated beverage. Mmm, I might have Earl Grey with a touch of honey. That is refreshing, but you can't, can you, because you're not allowed. Yeah, but we can do yoga. Whatever. <laughs> so there I was, with my friend Annie, following the six foot seven man down the seemingly endless corridor. And we followed him into a very big room. And there were 14 or 15 bikers lying around. And the air was heavy with beer and bong water. And one of the guys, short, bald and angry, in a beanbag, leaned forward and said... Hey, Argy, what you got there? <laughs> Argy, that was the guy's name. I thought, surname Bargy? <laughs> Found a couple of girls at the door. Then he looked at us and said... I guess you girls better sit down. Tell us why you're here. So can I ask you, do you know why the Jehovah's Witnesses call? No. <laughs> now, I'll tell you why they call. It's because Armageddon is coming, and that's the end of the world. Not the end of the Earth, but the end of the world as you know it, and if you don't listen to the Jehovah's Witnesses, the end of you. When I was a Jehovah's Witness, the slogan was... Millions now living will never die. The slogan is now... We never said that. <laughs> Now, while we don't know when Armageddon is, thanks to the artist at the Watchtower magazine, we do know what it will look like. Have you opened one of the magazines that they give you at the door or increasingly give out on the street? If you have, then you're ready to play. Who knows why the Jehovah's Witnesses call? <laughs> OK, fingers on buzzers. Question one. What does Armageddon look like? The end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, where the people's faces have melted off? I'm afraid that is incorrect. According to the Watchtower magazine, it looks like a fiery tornado hitting New York City. OK, moving on to question two. Most people in the pictures are running and screaming. But some people in the pictures are smiling through the fiery rain. Why is that? They're sadomasochists. Uh, no, I'm afraid it's, it's because they're Jehovah's Witnesses. So despite the horror all around them and the fact that they can smell the burning flesh of their dying loved ones, they're laughing. Question three. Why are they laughing? Because they'll live through this doomsday nightmare. That is correct. They are going to live. But for an extra ten points, do you know where they will live? Is it Macclesfield? <laughs> I'm afraid not, no. Uh, I'm afraid not. Oh. For the jackpot bonus, why will they not live in heaven? Uh, because heaven is full. <laughs> Amazingly, that is the correct answer. 
There is only room for 144,000 people in heaven, and those places are already taken or reserved. It's like a very exclusive nightclub heaven. If your name's not on the door, you're not getting in. <laughs> and no trainers. And finally, for the speedboat, where will they live if heaven is full? The recently trashed Earth. That is correct. Yes. Well done. Yes, they will clean up the fiery rain zone and restore it to a Garden of Eden like paradise. <laughs> now, you may all have your own personal definition of paradise, but the Watchtower's vision is very specific. In the magazine's illustrations, it's always people in national dress passing fruit to each other, <laughs> like a woman in a sari giving a pineapple to a chap in a kilt. <laughs> now, I was never very eager for the paradise to come. I should have been, but I wasn't, because I am a city girl. And this seems to be an entirely fruit-based economy. <laughs> have you ever picked fruit? It's really hard. And this is forever and ever and ever and ever, passing fruit for eternity. But it's got to be a fruitopia because we're all going to be vegans. So it is going to be paradise. It's just going to be one of those vegan paradises. <laughs> and listen, I'm not going to make a lot of cheap vegan jokes. Um, I admire vegans. It's ethical. It's good for you. But today's vegans do have death to look forward to, don't they? <laughs> I mean, this is going on for eternity. And I mean, I could do 50 to 80 years of veganism if I really put my mind to it. But by the 10,000th year, you're really going to need a bit of Stilton, aren't you? <laughs> Now, in these definitely factual pictures in the Watchtower magazine, there are often images like a little girl cuddling a tiger. Oh, no, I hear you worry. But don't. It's OK, because the tiger is also a vegan. <laughs> and I questioned this, and this was the official line from the Watchtower Society, as explained to me by the elders. In the Garden of Eden... Also a fruit-based economy, where one famous transaction brought the whole system down. Eden's Enron. Tigers had teeth like sheep. Big old vegan grass eaters. But after the fall of Adam and Eve, the neighbourhood got rough. So God let the tigers and the lions evolve teeth. So just to be clear about this, the tigers didn't evolve just the teeth. Claws evolved, venom evolved. But the animals themselves were created. Now, even at my most devout, I knew this was bollocks. <laughs> Either things had evolved or they hadn't. It was unlikely that convenient pockets of God-approved evolution had occurred. So let's choose to ignore this like I had to. Who will live on this paradise earth? Well, there are only seven million Jehovah's Witnesses and even fewer tigers. But all the people who have ever died who didn't know about the paradise will be resurrected. And Jehovah's Witnesses will teach these people about Jehovah's ways. Now, you might be thinking, but they'll be speaking a lot of different ancient languages. How will they ever understand each other? Well, because everyone will speak one perfect language. So it will be paradise. It'll just be one of those vegan Esperanto paradises. <laughs> And they will all have a thousand years to learn Jehovah's ways, and then after that, if anyone sins, in deed or thought, instant death. Capital punishment. So it will be paradise. It'll just be one of those vegan Esperanto totalitarian paradises. <laughs> and you might think, well, if it's going to be forever and ever, everyone's going to get really old. But we won't, because your body is going to get younger and younger until it's like when you were 21, only hotter. <laughs> and children are going to grow up until they're 21 and we'll all Benjamin Button into the middle. And you might think, wow, that sounds like a kind of awesome, never-ending, totally hot freshers week. But once the earth is full, there'll be no more need for children, so there'll be no more need for sex. So it will be paradise. It'll just be one of those vegan, Esperanto, totalitarian, sex-free paradises. <laughs> now, if I said to you there are two doors in the room you're in, through one there is fiery rain... I can guarantee you, you'll die. So we'll call that one the fire exit. <laughs> <laughs> but out the second door, there is fruit. We'll call that one the fruit exit. Some terms and conditions apply, but, you know, you'll get to live. Wouldn't you come with me out the fruit exit? I mean, we can work out the details later. At least we'll be alive. You'd come, wouldn't you? And now, what if the person you loved most in the world wanted to go out the fire exit, wouldn't you try and stop them? Wouldn't you just say, please, just come with me. Don't die. You would, wouldn't you? 
if you said yes, you're a Jehovah's Witness now. That's how easy it is. <laughs> so I told RG about the fire and the fruit, and he said... Right. So are you girls allowed to have sex before marriage? No. And are you married? No. Right. So you're virgins. And I remember thinking, not for much longer. <laughs> um, RG, um, Mr. Bargy, um, I think we'd better go. And he stood at the only exit, his huge body blocking the door. No, no. Why don't you girls stay and have a beer? And I started to wonder how long it would be before anyone looked for us. And I thought that my flatmate would worry if I wasn't home by midnight. Problem was, my flatmate was the girl sitting next to me. <laughs> so I decided if I was going to die, I should die doing what I'd come to do. Talking about the fruit. <laughs> so do you guys ever wonder why bad things happen to good people? I thought like this. And short, bald and angry in the beanbag, leaned forward and said... Yeah, I do. Because my mum died when I was little. And if there's a loving God, why did he let that happen? And I opened the Watchtower magazine in my lap. And there was a picture of a man looking into the middle distance. And underneath, I read out a scripture from the Bible that said God would catch all of our tears in a bottle. And the man leant forward for a moment, genuinely interested. And I read a little more. And he came a little closer. And Archie barged in between us and said... I think you girls better go. And we got up and we ran out the door and we ran down the corridor and we ran down the street. And I would recommend that if you are in a hostage situation and you have a watchtower, that you should use it. <laughs> now, when I was seven years old, I went to a new school and I just didn't have any friends yet. So I used to talk to God, who I'd met at Sunday school. But there was a bit of an age gap between me and God, so I wanted to be friends with other seven-year-olds. And there were two opportunities for friends. The first was an inter-school dancing competition where four little girls were going to be chosen from year three to dress in sequins and writhe in a concerning fashion to pop music. <laughs> My teacher, the aptly named Miss Power, stood up and said... We're going to choose the girls for the inter-school dance trope. All the blonde girls stand up. Go and stand over there by the wall. And she went down the road choosing the blonde she thought were the prettiest. You, you, you. Oh, and Janine Henney. Now, Janine Henney had brown hair, but she was an awesome dancer. And it was at that point I realised that if you were brunette, you needed a talent. <laughs> the second opportunity for friends came when I was invited to Girls Brigade, which is where non-blondes went in my Australian beach town to learn to be virtuous. It was kind of a religious girl guides. I found a lot of friends there, and so I spent the rest of my childhood praying in the bush. <laughs> Do you know this song? Give me oil for my lamp, keep me burning. Give me oil for my lamp, I pray. Hallelujah, give me oil for my lamp, keep me burning. Keep me burning till the break of day. OK, do you know this verse? Give me wax for my board, keep me surfing for the Lord. Give me wax for my board, I pray. Hallelujah. Well, I do, because I was brought up in some God-bothering version of Home and Away. <laughs> So when I found out that God, who for a long time had been my only friend and then was responsible for all my friends, had a plan for the earth that involved me, I thought I should listen. So what I'm saying is, if I'd been blonde, I never would have joined a cult. <laughs> but in some ways, I don't regret it. I mean, it, it prepared me for stand-up comedy. People think doing stand-up is brave, but at least the audience has left the house. <laughs> down a rural driveway with a shotgun in my back by a naked man. I think this is why there seems to be a disproportionate amount of ex-Jehovah's Witnesses in show business. Where I grew up, in a nearby congregation, there was a young man who used to dress up like Michael Jackson at parties. Michael Jackson himself being a very famous Jehovah's Witness. And this guy would put on Michael Jackson dance routines. That young man's name was Brother Peter Andre. <laughs> love him as the half-naked ITV2 ex-lover of Katie Price. But back then, he was a mild-mannered Jehovah's Witness to whom all girls were mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> I actually 
actually bumped into him backstage at a festival once and I said, oh, God, Peter, hi. Wow, I haven't seen you since our Jehovah's Witness days. You got out too? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just got to the point where I couldn't reconcile my feminism with the religion that subjugated women and also the intellectual stagnation that came with the ban and theological debate. It was really impossible for me to sustain. Yeah, I just really needed to have sex. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Jackson himself did turn up to my congregation once when he was in town on tour. He came to the Kingdom Hall with six bodyguards and afterwards declared he wanted to go knocking on doors. And this is true. He got in a limo, drove up to the door, got out with all his bodyguards around him, went up to the door, presented the Watchtower magazine, presumably a WTF moment for that person. <laughs> WTF does not stand for Watchtower fun. <laughs> then he got back in the limo, drove to the next door, got out, same thing, got back in the limo and drove away. We called him Two Doors Jackson. <laughs> so it was the first door of the morning and a man opened it and I said, Hi, I'm Deborah. Wow, I'm Benny. And that was weird, because they never normally told you their names. But Benny wasn't like other people. Benny was extraordinary. And although he didn't know it, Benny was about to change my life. Now, I really, really, really wanted to convert somebody. It wasn't expected. It was so difficult. In fact, it takes around 5,000 JWDKH, that's Jehovah's Witness door knocking hours, <laughs> to convert just one person. So I looked in my bag to get out my watchtower to give it to Benny. And there it wasn't. I'd left it on the kitchen table. I panicked and more to save face than anything. I said, I'm just calling to see if you'd like a free home Bible study. Now this can't work, this doesn't work. It's like going up to a girl in a nightclub and saying fancy a shag. <laughs> but Benny said, Hey, why don't you come in? And because I had learned nothing from the incident with the bikers, <laughs> I went inside. Benny was a cool black Cuban jazz musician. And he had escaped from Cuba while on a tour in Cape Town when he'd slipped out the back of a jazz club for a cigarette and never gone back. And I told Benny about the fruit and he said... That's cool, baby. <laughs> and I'd go round and see him every week for a free home Bible study. I'd read him a psalm and he'd play the sax for me. <laughs> now, I was supposed to give Benny up to a brother, because a woman isn't meant to study the Bible with a man, because they're paranoid they'll end up having one of the sorts of sex on the list. But we weren't doing that, so I hid Benny from the plumbers. <laughs> because I knew I could save him for the fruit, and he was the one. And one day, when the time was right, I said to Benny, Benny, will you come to the Kingdom Hall with me? Sure, baby. You'll need a tie. Hey, I'm a jazz musician. I'll get you a tie. <laughs> and the next Sunday I picked Benny up and I took him to the Kingdom Hall and I declared to all the plumbers that Benny was my Bible study and after the meeting all the electricians came around and they were lovely to him like they are in the beginning and I drove Benny back and he said he would come again next week and I went home and I thought about it and I worried because I knew that soon it would be too late for Benny to get out and the day before his baptism, two plumbers and an electrician would come to his house and say... We don't think you should be a jazz musician anymore. Because jazz clubs lead to jazz. And cigarettes. A and jazz cigarettes. We think you should give that up and become a plumber. <laughs> and I drove to his house to pick him up that Sunday. And I sat over the road. And I saw him waiting for me on his doorstep in his tie. And I thought about it. You see, I really wanted to save Benny for the paradise. But the thing is, Cuba has really amazing fruit and awesome national dress. And even one old man with a beard telling everyone what to do. And Benny hadn't wanted to live there. And I knew Benny couldn't get to the Kingdom Hall on his own and he didn't have my phone number. So I rolled the dice with Benny's eternal life and I drove away. And I still wanted to save someone for the paradise, someone from the fire for the fruit, but you know, just not Benny. Because it wasn't for him, he wouldn't enjoy it. But the truth is, once you've saved someone from being saved, you've got to admit you're not quite as happy as you're making out. And I mean, what about the tiger's teeth? This paradise, if I can't sell it, is it because I don't buy it? Oh my God, am I going to die? I think I'm going to die. My only life plan is feeding watermelons to tigers. 
Oh my God, I don't have a degree or a relationship or a mortgage. Don't worry, I'm saddled with all those things now. Oh my God. <laughs> but God in heaven, or maybe not, I'm going to die. And I realised, I realised then that the only reason that two plumbers and an electrician could come to my house and tell me how to live my life was because I let them. Because unless you're trapped in a basement, the cult is only ever in your head. So although I barely had a single friend who wasn't a Jehovah's Witness and I didn't have any money or any life beyond it, I rolled a dice. I figured life outside the cult, however terrifying it is, had to be worth giving up everything I knew and everyone I loved. I moved to London and I just stopped going. I started over. I didn't know how to flirt. I didn't know how to drink. I didn't know how to do downward facing dog. <laughs> but I learnt. <laughs> All this means, and this is a bit of a confession, I'm still technically a Jehovah's Witness. They count me every year on the global register as inactive. Inactive is really an understatement. <laughs> I'm lethargic to the point of sedentary. I left through a loophole, I just stopped going, and they kind of forgot to disfellowship me. I will probably be disfellowshipped sometime after this broadcast, so watch my Twitter feed. <laughs> and so I went to university, and I did everything I'd given up and missed out on. So much yoga. <laughs> Some things I would never have done if I hadn't realised really suddenly that I was going to die. And there's your problem right there. Leaving a cult is a lot like waking up from a coma. You have to live every year after that as if it's three. And you spend a lot of time trying to live the year you should have been 18, because when I was 18, I looked like I was auditioning for The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> and I would nail being 18 now. Like everyone, all of us, no matter how rich or beautiful or powerful, we all get exactly 365 chances to wake up and have a go at being 18. I wish you got 900 days to be like 21, and maybe only 32 days to be 84. <laughs> I think it's a flaw in the system. <laughs> but we get 365, and then it's gone. And that's how I feel about life now. I know that of all the people who've ever lived, and all the people who are going to live, it's my turn now. And knowing that is exhausting. <laughs> Every time I hear a voice in my head telling me what I can't do, what I shouldn't do, or telling me to put off paradise for another day, I know I'm in a cult. And I try and break out of it, but I think I've realised we're always in a cult. So I just try and make my cult of one a happy one. I try and roll the dice as often as possible. So maybe, roll the dice. Leave that job you hate. Just don't leave a note. You've been listening to Deborah Francis White Rolls the Dice. It was written and performed by Deborah Francis White. You also heard Tom Tuck, Carrie Ad Lloyd and Alex Lowe. The programme was produced by Alan Nixon and was a So Radio production for BBC Radio 4.